In Victorian Britain, vagrancy was endemic, and hundreds slept out of doors every night. Industrialization, insufficient landlord controls, and a systematic lack of support for the unemployed fueled poverty and homelessness. But there were many social ills that caused people to find themselves on the street, begging for bread and board. Just like then, as now, there are comparatively few people stirring after midnight, and when we are snugly tucked into our own beds, we are apt to forget the multitude outside in the rain and the storm, who are shivering the long hours through on the hard stone seats in the open or under the arches of the railway. These homeless, hungry people are, but being broken-spirited folk for the most part, they seldom make their voices audible in the ears of their neighbours. Now and again, however, a harsh cry from the depths is heard for a moment, jarring rudely upon the ear, and then all is still. Today we make one of these voices from the past heard again as we tell the life story of a vagrant from the 1850s. In a genuine account recorded by Henry Mayhew, a Victorian journalist, Mayhew's work is important as he went to great trouble to describe the lives of everyday people in London and went into great detail about their clothes, customs, work and pastimes, interviewing many of them, including the vagabond you are soon to meet. You will learn much about this man and also find out why a person might fall on hard times and onto harder streets either through bad choices or bad luck, but once you found yourself tramping the streets, it was very difficult to get work to pay for accommodation. As you will hear, a beggar was thought no more of than a dog in the street, and there were too many of them for most people, potential employers, or even family, to care. Before we move on, please consider clicking the subscribe button for more content like this. If you find this video interesting, I would really appreciate it if you could give it a thumbs up and share it widely with friends and family. Please check out the description to see how you can support the channel and the content we make. The first vagrant was one who had the thorough look of a professional. He was literally a mass of rags and filth. He was, indeed, exactly what in the act of Henry the Eighth is denominated a valiant beggar. He stood near upon six feet high, was not more than twenty-five, and had altogether the frame and constitution of a stalwart labouring man. His clothes, which were of fustian and corduroy, tied close to his body with pieces of string, were black and shiny with filth, which looked more like pitch than grease. He had no shirt, as was plain from the fact that, where his clothes were torn, his bare skin was seen. The ragged sleeves of his fustian jacket were tied like the other parts of his dress, close to his wrists, with string. This was clearly to keep the bleak air from his body. His cap was an old brimness, wide awake, and when on his head, gave the man a most unprepossessing appearance. His story was as follows. I'm a carpet weaver by trade. I serve me time to it. My father was a clerk in a shoe thread manufactory. He got thirty-five shillings a week, <coughs> and his house, coals and candles found him. He lived very comfortably. Indeed, I was very happy. Before I left home, I knew none of the cares of the world that I've known since I left him. My father and mother are living still. He is still as well off as when I was at home. I know this because I've heard from him twice, and seen him once. He won't do anything to assist me. I've transgressed so many times that he won't take me in hand any more. <coughs> oh, I will tell you the truth. You may depend upon it. Yes, indeed, I, I would, even if it were to injure myself. He has tried me many times, but now he has given me up. At the age of twenty-one he told me to go from home and seek a living for myself. He said he had given me a home ever since I was a child, but now I had come to manhood I was able to provide for myself. He gave me a good education, and I might have been a better scholar at the present time had I not neglected my studies. 
He put me to a day school in the town when I was eight years old, and I continued there until I was between twelve and thirteen. <coughs> I learnt reading, writing, and ciphering. I was taught the catechism, Christian doctrine, the history of England, geography, and drawing. My father was a very harsh man when he was put out of his way. That is. He was a very violent temper when he was vexed, but kind to us all when he was pleased. I have five brothers and six sisters. He never beat me more than twice, to my remembrance. The first time he thrashed me with a cane, and the last with a horsewhip. I'd stopped out late at night. I was then just rising sixteen, and had left school. I'm sure those thrashings did me no good, but made me rather worse than before. <coughs> I was a self-willed lad, and determined if I couldn't get my will in one way, well, I would have it in another. After the last thrashing, he told me he would give me some trade, and after that he would set me off and get rid of me. Uh, then I was bound apprentice as a carpet weaver for three years. My master was a very kind one, a runaway once. The cause of my going off was a quarrel with one of the workmen that was put over me. He was very harsh, and I scarce could do anything to please him. So I made up my mind to leave. <coughs> so I did. <laughs> the first place I went when I bolted was to Crewkern in Somersetshire. There I asked for employment at carpet weaving. I got some, and remained there for three days. But my father found out where I was, and sent my brother and a special constable after me. <laughs> they took me from the shop where I was at work, and brought me back, and would have sent me to prison, had I not promised to behave myself, and serve me time out as I ought. I went to work again, and when the expiration of my apprenticeship occurred, my father said to me, Sam, you have a trade at your fingers' ends. You are able to provide for yourself. <laughs> oh. <laughs> so, then I left home. I was twenty-one years of age. He gave me money, three pound, ten shillings, to take me into Wales, where I told him I should go. I was up for going about through the country. I made my father believe I was going into Wales to get work, but all I wanted was to go and see the place. <laughs> After I had run away once from my apprenticeship, I found it very hard to stop at home. I couldn't bring myself to work somehow. While I sat at the work, I thought I would like to be away in the country. Work seemed a burden to me. I found it very difficult to stick to anything for a long time. So I made up my mind, when my time was out, that I'd be off roving and see a little of life. Oh, I went by the packet from Bristol to Newport. After being there three weeks, I spent all the money that I had brought from home. I spent it in drinking, most of it, and idling about. After that, I was obliged to sell me clothes, etc. The first thing I sold was me watch. I got two pounds, five shillings for that. Then I was obliged to part with me suit of clothes. For these I got one pound, five shillings. With this I started from Newport to go farther up over the hills. Yeah, I like this kind of life much better than working uh, while the money lasted. I was in the public house three parts of me time out of four. I was a great slave to drink. I began to like drink when I was between thirteen and fourteen. At the time, my uncle was keeping a public house, and I used to go there, backwards and forward, more or less every week. <coughs> Whenever I went to see my uncle, he gave me some beer. I very soon got to like it so much that, while an apprentice, I would spend all I could get in liquor. This was the cause of my quarrels with my father. And when I went away to Newport, I did so to be my own master, and, uh, oh, and drink as much as I pleased, without anybody saying anything to me about it. I got to Nantiglow, and there I sought for work at the iron foundry, but I could not get it. So I stopped at this place three weeks, still drinking. Last day of the three weeks, I sold the boots off my feet to get food. 
for all my money and clothes were now gone. I was sorry then that I had ever left my father's house. But alas, I found it too late. I didn't write home to tell them how I was off. My stubborn temper would not allow me. I then started off barefoot, begging my way from Nanty Cloud to Monmouth. I told the people that I was a carpet weaver by trade. He could not get any employment, and uh, that I was obliged to travel the country against my own wish. I didn't say a word about the drink. <laughs> that would never have done. I took only two and a half pence on the road, nineteen miles long, and I'm sure I must have asked assistance from more than a hundred people. They said some of them that they had knelt for me, and others did give me a bit of barracos or barimini, that is, bread and cheese or bread and butter. Oh, money is very scarce among the Welsh, and what they have, they are fond of. They don't mind giving food. If you wanted a bagful, you might have it there of the working people. I inquired for a night's lodging at the Union in Monmouth. That was the first time I ever asked for shelter in a workhouse in my life. <laughs> I was admitted into the tramp room. Ah, oh, I felt then that I would much rather be in prison than in such a place, though I never knew what the inside of a prison was. No, not then. I thought of the kindness of my father and mother. Oh, I would have been better, but I knew that, as I'd been carrying on, I never could expect shelter under my father's roof any more. And I knew he would not have taken me in, had I gone back, or I would have returned. I was off from home, and I didn't much trouble me head about it after a few minutes. I plucked up my spirits and soon forgot where I was. I made no male friends in the Union. I was savage that I had so hard a bed to lie upon. It was nothing more than the bare boards and a rug to cover me. I knew very well it wasn't my bed, but still I thought I ought to have a better. Oh, I merely felt annoyed at its being so bad a place and didn't think much about the rights of it. <coughs> and in the morning I was turned out, and after I left I picked up with a young woman. <gasps> who had slept in the Union overnight. I said I was going on the road across country to Birmingham, and I asked her to go with me. <laughs> I'd never seen her before. She consented, and we went along together, begging our way. We passed as man and wife, and I was a carpet weaver out of employment. We slept in unions, in lodging houses, by the way. In the lodging houses we lived together as man and wife, and in the unions we were separated. I never stole anything during all this time. After I got to Birmingham, I made my way to Wolverhampton. <coughs> Blimey. My reason for going to Wolverhampton was that there was a good many weavers there, and I thought I should make a good bit of money by begging of them. Ah, yes, I found that I could always get more money out of my own trade than any other people. I did so well at Wolverhampton, begging... Then I stopped there for three weeks. I never troubled me yet whether I was doing right or wrong by asking my brother weavers for a portion of their hard earnings to keep me in idleness. <laughs> Many a time I'd given away part of my wages to others myself. Oh, I can't say that I would have given it to them if I had known they wouldn't work like me. I wouldn't have worked sometimes if I could have got it. I can't tell why. But somehow it was painful to me to stick long at anything. To tell the truth, I loved a roving, idle life. I would much rather have been on the road than at my home. Uh, I drank away all I got and feared and cared for nothing. And when I got drunk overnight, it would have been impossible for me to have <coughs> gone to work in the morning. <laughs> Even if I could have got it, the drink seemed to take all the work. Out of me. This oftentimes led me to think of what my father used to tell me that the bird that can sing and won't sing ought to be made to sing. <laughs> During my stay in Wolverhampton, I lived at a tramper's house, and there I fell in with two men well acquainted with the town. Yeah, and they asked me to join them in breaking open a shop. No, sir, no, I didn't give a thought whether I was doing right or wrong at all. I didn't think my father would ever know anything at all about it, so I didn't care. <laughs> I liked my mother best, 
much the best. She'd always been a kind, good soul to me, often kept me from my father's blows, and helped me to things unknown to my father. But when I was away on the road, I gave no heed to her. I didn't think of either father or mother till after I was taken into custody for that same job. Well, I agreed to go with the other two. They were old hands of the business, regular housebreakers. We went away between twelve and one at night. It was pitch dark. <coughs> and my two pals broke into the back of the house, and I stopped outside to keep watch. After watching for about a quarter of an hour, a policeman came up to me and asked me what I was stopping there for. I told him I was waiting for a man that was in a public house at the corner. <laughs> this led him to suspect me, it being so late at night. We went to the public house to see whether it was open, and found it shut. <coughs> then came back to me. As he was returned, and he saw me two comrades coming through the back window. That was the way they had got in. He took us all three in custody. Some of the passers-by assisted him in seizing us. The other two had six months imprisonment each, and I, being a stranger, had only fourteen days. <coughs> ah, you know, when I was sent to prison, I fought with my mother. I would have written to her, but couldn't get leave. Being the first time I ever was nailed, I was very downhearted at it. I, I didn't say I'd give it up. While I was locked up, I, I thought I'd go to work again and be a sober man when I got out. These thoughts used to come over me when I was on the stepper, that is, on the wheel. Uh, but I concealed all them thoughts in me breast. I said nothing to no one. <laughs> my mother was the only one that I ever thought upon. And when I got out of prison, all these thoughts went away from me. And I went again at my old tricks. From Wolverhampton I went to Manchester, uh, and from Manchester I came to London, begging and stealing wherever I had a chance. Uh, this is not my first year in London, I'll tell you the truth, because I am known here, and if I tell you a lie, you'll say, you've spoken on truth in one thing, and you'll do so in another. <laughs> first time I was in London, I was put in prison fourteen days for begging, and after I had a month at Westminster Bridewell for begging and abusing the policeman. Sometimes I'd think I'd rather go anywhere and do anything than continue as I was. But then I had no clothes, no friends, no house, no home, no means of doing better. I'd made myself what I was. <coughs> and I'd made me father and mother turn their backs upon me. And what could I do? But go on. I was as bad off then as I am now. And I couldn't have got work then if I would. I should have spent all I got in drink then. I oh, know. I wrote home twice. I told me mother I was hard up. Had neither a shoe to me foot, a coat to me back, nor a roof over me head. I'd no answer to my first letter, because it fell into the hands of my brother, and he tore it up, fearing that mother might see it. <laughs> and to the second letter that I sent home, my mother sent me an answer herself. She sent me a sovereign. She told me that my father was the same as when I first left home, and it was no use my coming back. She sent me the money, bidden me to get some clothes and seek for work. I didn't do as she paid. I spent the money, most part in drink. <coughs> I didn't give any heed either, whether it was right or wrong. Soon got, soon gone. You know, now they could have sent me much more than that if they had pleased. It was last June twelve month when I first came to London, and I stopped till the 10th of last March. I lost the young woman when I was put in prison in Manchester. She never came to see me in quad. Prison. She cared nothing for me. She only kept company with me to have someone on the road along with her, and I didn't care for her. Not I. One half of me time last winter I stopped at the straw yards, that is, in the asylums for the houseless poor here, and at Glass House. When I could get money, I had a lodging. rum to de tum after March I started off through Somersetshire. I went to me father's house then. I didn't go in. I saw me father at the door, and he wouldn't let me in. <laughs> oh, I was a little bit better dressed than I am now. 
He said he had enough children at home without me, and gave me ten shillings to go. He could not have been kind to me, or else he would not have turned me from his roof. My mother came out to the garden in the front of the house, after my father had gone to his work, and spoke to me. She wished me to reform our character. I could not make any rash promises then. I had but very little to say to her. I felt myself at that same time, for the very first time in my life, that I was doing wrong. I thought, if I could hurt my mother so, it must be wrong to go on as I did. I had never such thoughts before. My father's harsh words always drove such thoughts out of me head. But when I saw my mother's tears, it was more than I could stand. I was wanting to get away as fast as I could from the house. <laughs> yeah. And after that I stopped knocking about the country, sleeping in unions, up to November. Uh, then I came to London again, and remained up to this time. <coughs> Since I have been in town, I've stopped for work at the floor cloth and uh, carpet manufactory in the borough. And they wouldn't even look at me in my present state. I'm utterly tired of my life right now altogether, and would like to get out of it if I could. I hope at least I have given up my love of drink, and I'm sure if I could once again lay me hand at some work, I should be quite a reformed character. Well, I am altogether tired of carrying on like this. <coughs> I haven't made sixpence a day ever since I've been in London this time. I go tramping it across the country just to pass the time, and see a little of new places. When the summer comes, I, I want to be off. I am sure I have seen enough of this country now, and I should like to have a look at some foreign land. Old England, there's nothing new in it now for me. I think a beggar's life is the worst kind of life that a man can lead. <coughs> a beggar is no more thought upon than a dog in the street. And there are too many at the trade. I wasn't brought up to a bad life. You can see that by little things. By my handwriting. A and indeed, I should like to have a chance at something else. I have had the feelings of a vagabond for full ten years. I oh, know, and now I am sure. I I'm getting a different man. I begin to have thoughts and ideas I never had before. Once I never feared nor cared for anything, and I wouldn't have altered it if I could. <coughs> but now I am tired out, and if I haven't a chance of going right, why, I must go wrong. <laughs>